Yeah, excellent. Perfect. All right. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is approaches to the ventral extradural pathology of the cranial cervical junction. And I know that's a lot to swallow in a title, but you'll, as we go through this talk, you'll understand why I'm sort of saying ventral and extradural. So when you think about ventral compression of the cranial cervical junction, um, I separate these into two different ways you get ventral compression. One is from instability and the other is from tumor. And that tumor might be a primary tumor or metastatic. Now, for this talk today, we're gonna to talk mostly about ventral compression from instability rather than tumor. And, you know, there's three different words that have been kind of thrown around the literature for years uh, that describe the ventral compression from uh, acquired sort of changes. And those would be basilar impression, cranial settling and basilar invagination. And going through the literature and, and understanding how things evolved over time, I think these words all got confused with one another, mostly because our imaging techniques got better over time. And so we kind of rebranded these names. And so how I'm gonna use these terms is I'm gonna put the entire category as, and call it basilar impression. And then underneath those, uh, underneath that heading, I'm gonna talk about cranial settling and basilar invagination. So when I think of cranial settling, I think of the upward migration of the odontoid into the cranial vault. So if you look at this first CT scan here, you see the skull base, clivus in the front, pisteon in the back. This is the anterior arch of C1 and the posterior arch of C1. And here's the odontoid. And you can see the odontoid going up into the cranial vault. When we talk about basilar invagination, we're talking about upward migration of the entire cervical spine into, this, into the cranial vault. So if you look at the relationship between C1 and C2, it's actually quite normal, but the skull base itself, the basi occiput has remodeled and has invaginated so that bringing the cervical spine up into the uh, cranial vault. We'll get into that a little bit later. So there are different uh, measurements that people have come up with um, to try to understand cranial settling and so that you can understand it when you're looking at x-rays and then later when CT scans uh, became available. Uh, I think they're all great. Uh, some are a little bit more complicated to use than others and I'm a very simple person and I chose to use the McGregor's line for, for how I define my patients with cranial settling. And that's mostly just because to me, it's an easy measurement to make, but it's also one that I can reproduce on CT scans very easily. And then I can use it to compare patients more easily within my own group of patients rather than measuring every, every different parameter on them. So with the McGregor line, if you, if, if you have the odontoid tip sitting 4.5 millimeters or more above that line, which is the line between the hard palate and the, and the epistion, that's considered to have cranial settling. Now, how does cranial settling evolve and how does it come about? Well, ignore this uh, sort of change you see at two, three, but this cranial cervical junction is normal, okay? You have normal relationship between C1 and C2 and normal relationship between the basi occiput and C1. And if you look at the rotation of the cervical spine at C1, C2, or the, what the joint of C1, C2 does, is it allows us to rotate our head left and right about 50% 50, 50 of the range of motion that we have. It's not just a, a straightforward though uh, joint like a hinge, it's a joint that slides back and forth. So if this is the odontoid right in the middle here, you can see that C1 slides a little bit on the C2 at the, at the joints, okay? And the reason that's important is that when you start to have instability at C1, C2, laxity of the C1, C2 joint or transverse ligament, what happens is not only does it rotate left and right, but then you're starting to get changes in the atlantal dental interval as well, right? And so what you see on static X-ray sometimes of so these increases in Atlanta dental interval is more of a three, you know, is a two-dimensional representation of what's really happening. And as this happens, okay, the odontoid can angulate left or right or back, which puts the C1, C2 joint laterally in a different position. It allows the C2 bone to telescope into C1. So as this progresses, and what you'll see is you'll see an increased atlantodental interval, right? And 
over time, what happens is that if, if this goes on long enough, the, the body will try to stabilize that joint and it forms this panis. And if that goes on long enough, then what will happen is you'll get a little bit of a deformity forming. And then what will happen is that the odontoid will start going up into the skull base, right? It's actually now pistoling up through the C1 arch and going up, right? So here's just some other images of it. You can see this person actually has uh, occiput C1 assimilation, but you can see that the odontoid is now going further up in the skull base and, and retroverting. It's also asymmetrically going up into the skull base though, because the, there is some rotation that allows this to happen. And you can get this to progress further and further. It can also go retro, retrovert as well, so that you can have the odontoid tip almost touching the back of the C1 arch. Now this is in distinction though from what we see with uh, basar invagination, right? And in basar invagination, the typical patients that we see that have this problem are patients with osteogenesis imperfecta or Paget disease, where the relationship between C1 and C2 actually looks normal. You ignored this whole skull base, right? But what happened is, is that this whole C1 C2 complex has now migrated up into the skull base because the basi occiput has started to invaginate on itself to allow it to come up. So when you look at these in axials, you can actually see normal C1, C2 relationship, right? Except for the cervical spine is at the midbrain level, right? Which is not where it should be. And even in this patient so far up there, it's causing hydrocephalus. Um, patients with osteogenesis and perfecta, what they, what they get is they get these, they get long bone fractures, right? But what also happens in the skull base, we think, is that they're getting micro fractures of the, the skull base. And this is caused by collagen, um, uh, inappropriate collagen formation, right? And when these micro fractures happen, that's when the frame of magnum uh, and the basic occiput re remodel and allow this to happen. And we see there are different types of OI, but in the type three OI is where you see the more common uh, uh, basic invaginations. And this doesn't happen in all of them, but 60% of them will happen in there. Now, after you understand exactly how to categorize these patients, then you can start to think about how you're gonna treat these patients. And I also separate the treatment paradigms into two different distinct categories. One's indirect decompression and one's direct uh, decompression. So when I was a resident, when we saw somebody who had um, a C2 panis, we didn't quite understand what was really happening. This was you know, quite a while back, right? And at that time, the standard treatment for these was to do an odontoidectomy followed by an OC fusion. Well, we learned right later that this is really inappropriate for this kind of diagnosis. Really, the, this, this problem is caused by C1, C2 instability. And really, those people just need to be stabilized and the panels will disappear over time. If they're having progressive symptoms, then maybe they need to be decompressed, but they usually can uh, be treated indirectly. Also, we learned that if, if somebody's even getting some cranial settling, that that can be reversed by indirect decompression, either through traction preoperatively, traction intraoperatively, or direct uh, decompressive reduction techniques posteriorly, which um, was really popularized by uh, Dr. Goel in, in, in India. And then if those aren't possible, if, the, if, that, if that deformity is fixed, then you might need a, de a direct decompression. Let me take you through these different concepts. JP, uh, as you show us the, the, some cases, I'm going to jump in just for a minute and ask uh, Dr. Gibbs a question, uh, because I know I've learned a lot, uh, you know, honestly, since spending time with you about the difference between cranial settling, basal invagination. A lot of people use it interchangeably, which I know you're, uh, it's one of your, like your pet peeves. But I'm wondering whether in neuroradiology, they, they, uh, when do you, in neuroradiology, do you guys make that distinction, whether it's cranial settling, basal invagination? What, what, in, in, your, in, in the neuroradiology world, what are your thoughts on, the, on those two entities? So it's, yeah, so my mentor actually, this, that's one of his big talks in his specialty. And um, he does define and distinguish them as we just heard, kind of the same way, but most radiologists do not, because it's very complicated. Um, but it is very pathology dependent as, as we just heard, you know, like his example is in some of these bone softening diseases, it's like a rotting pumpkin on a stick. And that's a very different process than a child who has platybasia and already abnormal skull base and, um, or somebody with a different process. So 
we don't always see a lot of these cases. Some people will distinguish them, but I think it's a pretty high level neuroradiology distinction. I don't think a general radiologist would know, or you know, even most of us would probably have a little trouble and have to think about calling it the right thing. Got it. Thank you. I yeah. love that. That's, that's, that's what I thought. Pumpkin on a stick. That's great. You like that? I had to share I that. I have to use that. I, yeah. that I use that in my talks too. It's a good analogy. Great. Thank you. So, sorry, JP, to interrupt. Go ahead. That's right. So, um, in the beginning of, of this whole cranial settling problem, what you'll see is you'll see C1, C2 instability. So this, I'm going to give you examples of each of these different cases and how we treat them, right? So this is a problem of, of laxity between C1 and C2. And this is um, a 14-year-old uh, child with rheumatoid arthritis that has a C1, C2 instability. And, and you can see just even between the CT and the MRI, there's, there's actually big changes and there's clearly motion going on here, right? We're not, we don't have flexion extension x-rays, but I'm sure on flexion extension x-rays, you'd be able to see this moving. But by just looking at this, you know that this is gonna move and you know this is gonna be reducible. And so in the operating room, you can reduce this. Oh, sorry. You can reduce this. And there are different techniques for doing that. This is just an example of one where uh, using C C1 lateral mass screws plus C2 interlaminar or translaminar screws, however you wanna talk about them. There's an interesting, kind of um, a geometry going on here. So in order for you to get the rods to line up from your C1 lateral mass screws to your C2 interlaminar screws, we, we realized you actually had to put a bend right here. And when you put that bend in there and you leave these rods longer, if you reduce this using the rods, it actually perfectly realigns the cervical spine. And it has, has to do with this geometry right here. So if you lock the screws on your onto your lateral mass screws of C1 on both sides with the rods, leave these loose, these two interlaminar screws, put a rod holder here and distract between them. This will actually drive C2 forward up against the, uh, up against the anterior arch of C1. And that'll reduce this and that, that brings that back into position. You can do the same technique with C, C1 lateral mass screws and C2 pedicle screws. Um, and actually, I, I rarely do it with interlaminar screws just because I, I tend to like a C2 pedicle screw more just from its lower profile than the C2 interlaminar screws. The other thing that happens though, over time is if, if you don't catch the C1, C2 instability or if the C1, C2 instability doesn't become a problem of, from a bony perspective, your body tries to stabilize the situation. Same thing is analogous to in the lumbar spine when you have a synovial cyst at L4-5 that usually arise, or that arises from some instability in that joint. And if you stabilize that joint, that synovial cyst in the lumbar spine will disappear. We usually don't wait for that synovial cyst to disappear in the lumbar spine. We usually resect it and fuse at the same time. But in the cervical spine, if you fuse that, if you fuse that C1, C2 joint together, this panis will disappear. And this, this is a, uh, a gentleman with a, a C2 panis, non-rheumatoid arthritis, at six weeks later, you can see the panis is completely resolved and the spinal cord is completely decompressed. So just from here to here, in six weeks, that resolves. This person had a C1 laminectomy, but that C1 laminectomy is a posterior decompression, not, not this ventral decompression. But that stabilization allows that to decompress. Now, as things progress, let's say you don't have that panis formation, or maybe you had the panis formation, and then you start getting the C2 starting to pissing up into the... Um, through the C C1 arch, now you're getting something called C, uh, you're getting the cranial settling, but you're also getting some pseudo stabilization, where if you were actually to get flexion extension x-rays on these patients, they don't, they tend not to move. And years ago, again, this is uh, decades ago, we used to think these things were semi-stable, but what's happening here is that the patients aren't able to move, but they're getting brainstem compression, cervical spinal cord compression from this uh, cranial settling in this area. So the panis disappears because it pseudo stabilizes, but this is still unstable, but this is still reducible. So you can reduce this with traction preoperatively or, tra or traction or reduction uh, procedures intraoperatively. So this diagram here, is, which is a beautiful illustration from Ian Sook, who was her illustrator at Hopkins, you can see that the patient's actually in a Mayfield, so their head's fixed, okay? Put instrumentation in the cervical spine, standard way, and instrumentation in the occiput and put your rods in position. The first step of this is you're really trying to drag the odontoid outside of the skull base, okay? So what you wanna do is you, you, you lock the um, 
screws on the occiput and you leave the screws loose with locking that screw in the cervical spine. And then if you distract between the occiput and the cervical spine, or the occiput and the, cer the cervical lateral mass screws on both sides so it's symmetric, you're gonna drag the sedentoid out of the head. So even though this head is fixed in the Mayfield, there's enough space on the chest that things are able to move because you're usually not trying to do this more than a centimeter. After it's been, after the odontoids pulled out of the head, what you're gonna do is you're gonna lock these cervical spine lateral mass screws, loosen the locking nut on the occipital plate, place a C-clamp of some sort right here and then compress across this area. And what you're doing is you're forcing now this together, right? And by forcing that together, you're dragging the odontoid forward. That makes sense. This is something you sometimes have to work out on the sawbone to really understand how that actually moves. And it's also something very good to think about before you actually do it in the operating room because you can drag it the wrong direction if you were to distract there. And so that patient that I showed you in the beginning, this is the, the post-reduction maneuver, all from a posterior approach where you can see the odontoids well aligned up against C1. Uh, JP, uh, yeah. quick uh, comment. This is definitely a fantastic interruptive te uh, technique that uh, you can benefit so much from, and we've done a case together on this. So this, this technique is pioneered by Dr. Walensky and, at uh, Johns Hopkins. One thing that um, is important to mention is to get the most of that technique. You got to definitely do a decompression, get into the joints, that plant to axial joints and release them. So you can, so your distraction, interruptive distraction techniques work. Uh, there's some opportunity too, to fill that gap with a bone graft uh, in an effort not to have those patients resettle. Exactly. I mean, uh, Nader makes a fantastic point. And this is actually something that really we need to credit uh, Atul Ghul for his work in India, because he, he, he did a lot of this pioneer work, uh, not necessarily going up to the occiput, but fusing between C1 and C2, um, and really getting into those joints at C1, 2 laterally and, and disconnecting that area, because if you don't do that, things aren't going to move very easily. Now, after we talked about indirect compression, now we need to talk about direct compression because sometimes things are too fixed and they're not gonna move, okay? And so that means resecting bone to get to where you're going. So really, you really wanna think about where is the pathology? And so the pathology dictates your surgical approach, okay? So if it's ventral compression, you need to somehow get there ventrally. And you need to separate this into intradural and extradural pathology because intradural pathology, you don't wanna go through the mouth. You don't want to go through the nose. I mean, it, it, you know, we are doing more and more of this stuff endonasally and endoscopically endonasally for intradural pathologies, but the CSF leak rates are pretty high and the risk is pretty high for meningitis. So in my mind, I, I try to avoid that as much as possible. But for extradural pathology, you want, and, and if you need, if something's non-reducible, then you need to do a de direct decompression. So what are our different trajectories for getting there? So you can go through the nose or underneath the lip, you can go through the mouth, or, and I'll talk about later, you can go through the neck. Some important anatomy. So this is looking through the mouth, right? If the front of the face has been removed, this is, this is um, a, a nice dissection here where you can see, this is the anterior arch of C1 right here longus capitis muscles that are covering the anterior arch of C1 and your longus coli muscles that you're used to seeing in the cervical spine that go from the anterior arch of C1 down to C2. And then you're gonna see the other ones at other levels. Very important to keep in mind though, lateral, about a little bit more than a centimeter off midline, there's the carotid arteries on either side, right? The vertebral arteries are back here, they're, they're safe, but the carotid artery is the ones at risk. And in some patients, these carotid arteries can actually be kissing in the middle. So you need to understand your anatomy before you get in there and looking at the MRI scans, because if, if that's the case, you, you definitely don't want to go through that, that corridor. Now, if you, once you remove the anterior arch of C1, you're looking at the odontoid. Behind the odontoid, you're looking at the transverse ligaments, the ala ligaments in that area, and then the tutorial membrane. And so that's a basic anatomy of that area. So the traditional workhorse of this is the transoral approach, all right? So if you think about it in a very simplistic uh, way of thinking about getting to the spine, if you stick your finger in your mouth and touch the back of your throat without throwing up, you'll be touching the anterior arch of C1, okay? So there are several different retractors that are made for this. The traditional one's a Dingman, and there's a, a Spetzler's Ontac retractor for going transorally. And this is looking through the mouth, 
Uh, one of the key things to do is if you're going to do this, make sure you do an orotracheal intubation or a tracheostomy. The tongue is depressed this way. A red rubber can be placed and tied to the, to the uvula and you can pull the uvula out of the way. And then you're looking at the posterior pharynx. And then you split the posterior pharynx in a vertical fashion. And then you're looking at the anterior arch of C1. You drill that out and you drill out C2. And then this is the transverse ligament behind. And this is actually, this is a very old picture from way back when before, and now we don't really do this for this anymore, but this was for a panis. And this is that panis cheesy sort of material that you can take out. Um, another example, though, this is somebody who has problems not just at um, C1, C2, but they also have problems at C2, 3, 3, 4. And, and this was a complicated uh, story of this lady, but this had to be approached ventrally. So initially, actually, she had met multiple attempts at other institutions with a posterior approaches, but every time they, they tried to position her, they would lose signal. So that eventually we had to go ventrally. And this was too high up in the cervical spine to reach this with the regular uh, anterior cervical approach. And so it, it a modified transoral approach had to be approached with this. So for this, looking at here, you can see that the anterior arch of C1 is in normal position. C2 is angulated and C3 is retropulsed this direction. And in order to uh, deal with this, we do partial corpectomy of C2 and, and corpectomy of C3 uh, to deal with this. And the location of this required really a combination of going through the mouth, but also going through the neck. And so with this, we do something called a transoral trans mandibular approach, right? And so with that, what you're trying to do is you, you're gonna split the jaw to get a, a more extensile approach. Here, you wanna avoid the foramen for the uh, mandibular branches for the fifth nerve to keep, uh, to keep the teeth uh, innervated. And then as you split the jaw, you can actually see through the, 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 pharyng the pharyngeal mucosa or the, the, the mucosa on the base of the mouth, you can actually see the uh, uh, hypoglossal nerve as, as well as the seventh nerve in that area to avoid them. And so you're working ar around those the entire time. And then you add that to your extensile cervical approach and then you can get exposure all the way from the, the top of the clivus down through the entire cervical spine. And so interoperatively what that looks like, this person was positioned in a halo first. You see there's a tracheostomy in place, nasogastric feeding tube. Here's the exposure, mental foramen right here. As we split the jaw, the tongue's being depressed, posterior pharyngeal incision right here. And that, and that allows you to get access to this area where you can get a decompression in that area. Now, this is what the cosmetic features of this are, is that you'll see a scar that goes down the front of the face and off to the, the neck, which, and this person is healed quite nicely, but it's still cosmetically uh, not that appealing to people. The other things about that, there's the morbidity, like we spoke about earlier, there's the oral floor contamination if you get a CSF leak, there's a risk of meningitis with a CSF leak. These patients, uh, either for a transoral or for a transoral transmandibular, they need to have prolonged intubation. And for a transmandibular, we, we perform a tracheostomy at the time. You need to avoid PO intake for a period of time so that that posterior pharynx can heal. And so particularly with the um, transmandibulars, we'll perform a gastrostomy at the time of uh, pre preoperatively or at the time of surgery. They can have trouble with phonation changes. And this is for the transoral or for the transmandibular. Pharyngeal dehiscence can be a problem. Cosmesis is a problem. And if, these patients, if this is a tumor case, mandibular pseudoarthrosis is a problem with radiation treatment for these patients. So if we can avoid it, we try to avoid it. Back in uh, 2005, uh, Kassam, when he, was at, um, when he was in Pittsburgh, he actually um, was pioneering all these endonasal um, techniques for the skull base. And um, he was probably one of the first people to actually go for an endoscopic and a nasal approach to taking out the odontoid. And in this case, you can see that, you know, remember this is 2005, so things have changed considerably since that time. And I'd say that maybe the indications for this operation were not quite the right, but the operation itself was a good operation. And that he had a patient who had um, C1 C2 instability with a panis formation and was going to approach us with an endoscopic and a nasal approach. But to get there, you can see that you can get to the bottom of the clivus you can re resect the bottom of the clivus. You can take out the anterior arch of C1 and take out C2. And in his post-op CT scan, you can see that he has a nice resection of that bone in that area. So this is a, also a, a nice way to get to the, the uh, top of the cervical spine. 
downsides of this approach is that it is still a very deep working corridor, but again, you're still going through a contaminated area. So if you have a CSF leak and you have trouble controlling it, that can be an issue for patients. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a procedure that I developed and this, this really came up um, as an alternative to getting up to the upper cervical spine. When I was a resident, um, you know, we were, we were doing a lot of these odontoid screw placements for trauma. And one of the things that I found exceptionally frustrating was uh, getting the right retractor for this. And so at that time, we started using tubular retractors for uh, getting to the uh, odontoid for placing screws because this apple bomb retractor was always very painful. It would, it would kind of move, you get it in position, then this esophageal blade would get it out of the way and you have to restart and position things. So then we, we made a, a custom beveled tubular retractor at that time. Um, it's not placed uh, with dilation. This was just to keep soft tissue out of, out of the tube while you're putting it in there. But you do an, essentially an anterior cervical approach at C4-5 like you would for ACF. Go down to the spine. You don't need to elevate the longest coli. And then you put your retractor in position. And then looking at your lateral cervical spine x-ray, you can see your retractor. And you can actually see the nice bottom of, the, uh, of C2 and C2-3 disc and C3. So you can uh, work down this tube for placing your screw. Now, one of the things I thought about though, is that, you know, if I can put a screw in this position, I could probably drill out the odontoid from this position if I drilled along that same trajectory, why not, right? So I had a patient like this where uh, we had um, an odontoid that was sitting very far up into her skull base from cranial settling. And in order to resect this, this would really require a transoral and transmandibular resection to get all the way up here. Because if you think about a transoral resection, you're going to get to about here. And a nasal, you'll get there, but you really need to take a lot off to get there. And you probably won't get low enough to get this. And getting this deep through the, through the nose could be really challenging. And so in order to get this through a traditional approach, it would be a trans, um, oral transmandibular approach to resect this, this, and all this. And for this patient, that was going to be a very high morbid operation for her. But we felt that if we resected this through the neck, through an ACF type of approach, but using that tubular retractor, bring an endoscope in and bring in a drill in, we could drill all the way along here and bring this out. And so this is what it looks like through the artist's rendition of this, the tubular retractor, a 35 degree endoscope, so that you can see in front and down, bring in a drill in like we would use for MIS cases and suction and irrigation. Now I use a bone rash, like a sauna pet type of thing, uh, so I don't have to bring a separate irrigator in there and there's no spinning parts, but essentially it's the same technique. In the operating room, we use neuronavigation to try to help understand the anatomy because the anatomy is always distorted with these kind of cases. Uh, the imaging quality at the time when I was first per performing this is quite poor, but it's gotten much better, especially now that we have intraoperative CT scans and O-arms and things of that like. Um, and then this is what the view looks like. You know, if you were to stick your head looking down that tube would be very uncomfortable, but bringing the endoscope in, it allows you to just look straight ahead of you at the, at the monitor and then also at the neuronavigation at the same time and, and work in a bimanual fashion. And again, this is that anatomy we were looking at previously. What's important to understand is that we're docking the tube on the anterior arch of C1 right here. And the bottom of that tube of the bevel is probably sitting over the C3 vertebral body. So the posterior pharynx esophagus is completely protected, carotid is protected. This carotid is, the both carotids that are anterior arch of C1 are protected because we're gonna be drilling along the anterior surface of C2 along the sedontoid behind the anterior arch of C1 and leaving the anterior arch of C1 alone. So this is really the trajectory we'll be looking at in the operating room. So if this is C1, this is C2, C2-3 disc is here. We'll be looking along here and drilling right underneath this anterior arch of C1 all the way to the tip of the odontoid and then back down again. So this, again, just to- uh, If you start to interrupt, uh, this is Ali. So on cases like this, um, have, do you still attempt preoperative traction or have you found, or after doing it a few times, you've realized they don't really don't, they don't reduce that much. So you just go ahead, you know, you proceed with the technique that you're describing. What, when, what, what, is, what is the current, you know, your current use uh, of traction for what type of cases? Yeah, so uh, I used to put everybody in preoperative traction. I would torture people in the ICU for at least a week before surgery and get a lot of pneumonias and problems like that. And, and I started to develop a gestalt of which patients I could reduce and which ones I couldn't. Uh, 
or which ones that I thought would, would move a little bit and wouldn't move a lot. And uh, now I don't do preoperative traction on, I would say almost anybody, because I, I find that I can judge whether or not they're gonna be reducible preoperatively just based on what their anatomy is. Like this person right here where you have settling probably on the order of about, I don't know, three centimeters or, or more, you're probably, if you tried to pull that much on the, on the, uh, to distract them that much, you might cause neurologic injury if you're making that big of a, a movement on somebody in that short of time. So this is a person I wouldn't attempt a reduction, whether or not in preoperative traction or, or intraoperatively, I would just resect that. But if you have somebody who has C1-2 instability and they don't have that significant of a, of a cranial settling at that point, then I think that um, I would try posterior approach with you know, distracting the C1-2 joint and, and reducing them that way. So JP, you didn't sense? try intraop traction with this patient, huh? Uh, you know, back at this time, I probably because I can see the CT. Because maybe it looks a little bit better when. when can you go back to the intraop CT? It looks like it's a little bit better. Maybe there was a little bit of intraop because that helps. You know, that helps a little bit. I don't know. I, it's hard to see anything on this intraoperative CT, but yeah, okay. But I, I, you know, on on this person, I, I mean, I think it. You know, I guess it can help if you fix them in that position, but. Uh, reality of it is, is that it's the same, the same amount of bone you're really resecting. So I'm not yeah. sure that makes that big of a difference, to yeah. tell you the truth. And they do get a lot of pneumonias by right, keeping them there, and they, and they hate it, and they complain every day to you. Um, and this is the postoperative view. This is, you know, immediately postoperative, so she still has an atracheal tube in, in place. But you can see that that odontoid that was all the way up here is resected. Now, the trajectory we come at is very funny. So this is actually C3, right? And this is the back of the bottom of C2. So it, it leaves this weird, sharp looking bone, but that's, it's not like there's spinal cord draped over this bone. So it's not a, a, a problem in that area. And you still have the anterior arch of C1 there as well. Another example of the same type of thing where you have cranial settling and resection of that odontoid. Um, and this was followed up with OC fusion and a C1 laminectomy. This is a, a, a unique case in that this person had had um, this panis formation, and uh, for some reason, uh, she presented to her original neurosurgeon with gait difficulty, and also urinary incontinence. And that person diagnosed uh, her with um, uh, hydrocephalus and decided to do a shunt, and uh, she didn't actually get any better, and progressively got worse. So when I saw her, she was quadriplegic. And I felt that just doing a C1, C2 fusion at this point to see if this panis would disappear would probably not be enough for her given her progression of her symptoms. So she had an odontoidectomy and resection of the panis, but also she had the spondylosis down below through that same approach through the C4, C4, 5 ACF approach. We did both through the same incision. This is just the, um, a summary of the first 15 patients that I operate on now over 50 with them. Um, and the, do have, uh, sorry, do you have a preference whether you do the fusion first or the odontoidectomy? Does it matter which the order? Um, it doesn't make that much of a difference, except for um, you know once they're fused, they're a little bit more difficult to position. So doing the odontoidectomy first is, in, in my mind, preferable, uh, unless I think I'm going to be able to get away with the reduction posteriorly, and maybe that'll be enough, and then I'll do the posterior approach first. But I. What I will do is I will do the fusion on the same day. And so when I first started doing this, I planned on staging them because I knew I was gonna be slow at this, right? Um, but now the anterior approach is much faster and I, and I just don't feel comfortable leaving them even in a halo overnight because there's so much move, movement after you've taken out the, the dontoid uh, that it, um, it just makes me un, uncomfortable. So I'll flip them the same day. So these are the first 15 patients um, in my series, uh, and they ranged in age all the way down to uh, 11 years old, uh, all the way up to 73 years old in this uh, group of patients. And within this group, there's, there are lots of different uh, types of pathologies causing the problems. Uh, uh, OI was a couple of them. And so those were true basal invagination patients and the rest were cranial settling patients. The range of uh, settling ranged from, here we have zero millimeters, but that's because this was really a retroid odontoid. That was that retroid odontoid panis and that C6 stenosis patient that I showed you. 
all the way up to 35 millimeters in the severe OI patients. But you can see the OI patients have severe vasomer vaginitis, 35 millimeters, 31 millimeters. Within these, this group, um, we did obviously have uh, some complications. And uh, the complications that we, we had, we did have two, three CSF leaks, but because this was going through the neck, none of them were of any consequence to the patient. They all healed up with pseudomeningocils, but then they uh, disappeared. Uh, I did have uh, two patients with dysphagia, one patient that had dysphagia preoperatively, and then another person that developed dysphagia after they uh, had a trauma after, after surgery um, and actually injured their instrumentation, so they had to be revised. Uh, one person had a 12th nerve palsy, and this was actually secondary to uh, a screw, uh, lateral mass screw placed posteriorly in a patient with um, poxiput C1 assimilation. So uh, this person taught me the lesson that I do not do a lateral mass screw in a post C1 assimilation patient because the screw always aims towards the hypoglossal canal, and that's a high risk procedure. Now, here's an interesting case that uh, I, I did in, in, and this was. Um, a lady that was very small uh, and very skinny with uh, some mild cranial settling. And I thought that this was a patient that I could probably reduce posteriorly. She had oxbut C1 assimilation that you can't really see on this cut, but you can see it in the back here. And she had this large holocord syrinx. And the plan was to reduce her so that we'd have improved CSF flow in the front. So I tried first posteriorly, and what I did with her, uh, which was unique, is that I did this operation in the intraoperative MRI scanner. And that was mostly for curiosity rather than the need for the technology. And we first did the, um, o, uh, the posterior approach with the occipital cervical instrument of fusion in the reduction or attempted reduction and did a pre and post MRI scan and didn't see any changes in the uh, uh, syrinx, but also I really couldn't get her to reduce. And then I did an endoscopic trans uh, cervical odontoidectomy uh, on her in the MRI scanner. And here's the position in the MRI scanner. And this is the fusion of the CT and MRI scanner for navigation. And what's interesting is that this, this image here on the top set, this is the immediately pre-resection MRI scan. And this is the immediate post resection MRI scan. So this is in the same position in the Mayfield in the MRI scanner in the same, you know, just a few hours apart from one another. And what's interesting is that the syrinx is getting smaller even in that short period of time. So this yellow line here corresponds to this yellow line here and this red line corresponds to this line. And you can see that in the exact same positions in the gantry that the syrinx is smaller, which is fascinating to me because I always thought that syrinxes would take six weeks to many months for them to start to improve. And this one we showed that we could actually see it improve right away. And to see that this was durable, this is actually an MRI scan on her a year afterwards. And you can see the syrinx still improving and lots of flow in front of the cervical, uh, spinal cord and brainstem, which I thought was a very fascinating finding. I'm not advocating for using the, the intraoperative MRI for this, but it was interesting for this person. Then, you know, the more you do of these things, the more complicated these patients are that, that come to you. So you gotta be careful what you wish for. So uh, this is a patient that had a uh, clipophile with occiput C1 assimilation and cranial settling. So essentially her entire cervical spine is fused. When you see her also in clinic, this is what she looks like. is right here at the sternal notch. So she couldn't get a tracheostomy. And she had, her opening of her mouth was about a centimeter. I didn't think I could get into this, this neck here to do an odontoidectomy through the neck. And her mouth hardly opened for me to be able to go through her mouth either. I wanted to go through her nose to do a uh, endonasal approach, but she had coenal atresia as well. So I couldn't get through there. So we decided to do a traditional sublabial approach like we used to do for transsynoidals. And then we had to take out the hard palate so we could get down to this area to resect that. And this is what that looks like through the artist's rendition. And this is the resection. And I can tell you that is a, it is a deep path going into nasally or sublabial to get to the odontoid, but eventually you can. And the other very difficult part about this is that there's no retraction once you get deep down in there. So you have very limited ability to move the soft tissue out of the way. <laughs> 
Uh, JP, just before we uh, uh, lose track of the questions, a couple of questions from the participants. Uh, the first one from our very own Dr. Rasuli. Uh, he wants to know if you use a diamond drill bit for the resections, or basically what's your choice of, of, uh, of a drill bit? And then the second, we are, you already answered the question about CSF leaks in your, uh, in your case series. So the second question is, do you use a ventral uh, cage or bone graft uh, after resection? Um, what, what are you, what's your reconstruction uh, look like uh, after resection? Thank okay. you. So for the first question, do I use a diamond burr? So in, in the beginning, I did use a diamond burr and use like a, a four diamond on a very long extended MIS type of uh, handpiece. Um, it's, it's great, but one of the things that uh, uh, drives me crazy is I, I hate uh, an endoscope that has blood on it or dust or fluid. And uh, I waste so much time bringing the endoscope in and out. So it just made me insane. And so uh, I started shifting towards using uh, one of these um, uh, oscillating uh, bone rasps, like a sauna pet type of thing with a minimally invasive tip. And what's nice about that is there's number one, there's no spinning parts. So if you need to have a cotinoid for whatever reasons, let's say you're working close to the dura and you have some bleeder that you want to control and drill out at the same time, you can do that without the worry of creating that helicopter of death grabbing onto your uh, uh, drill. Uh, and, and then the other thing is that it, it also, you know, it irrigates while it's drilling. So you get rid of one other extra feature of having to irrigate down that tube. Um, it's just kept my um, endoscope a lot cleaner. So that's what I tend to use for that. Um, it, downside of it compared to the diamond is it doesn't coagulate the bone as much. So it, it bleeds a little bit more, but it's not bad. Um, the second question was about reconstruction. So you don't need to re reconstruct the front. You just leave it alone. And um, the reconstruction is all posterior. So if you're in that in those situations, usually it's an oxput to C3 or C4 instrumented fusion. Um, and um, the, the graft then is going laterally or in the C1, C2 joints as well. Um, but you don't need to reconstruct the anterior column of the spine because the, the weight of the head is going through from the occipital condyles through the C1 lateral masses to the C2 lateral masses. And then it shifts its focus of where the weight's distributed once you get from C2 down to C3, then it starts going into the disc ventrally. Um, uh, I think that's sort of, those were your two questions, right, Ali? Yes, yeah, I think I think that answers uh, those questions. Thank you. Yeah, so in conclusion, then, and please then, then let's uh, get more casual and have questions. Uh, but in conclusion, I, I'd say that, you know, you really need to understand the pathology you're dealing with and what, whether or not you can do this with an indirect decompression, which would be traction reduction or posterior decompression followed by a posterior occipital cervical fusion or C12 fusion, depending how extensive this is, or if you're gonna need something more uh, aggressive with a direct decompression followed by a posterior occipital fusion. And then location of the pathology to take to your approach. So intradural things, I really wouldn't do transoral, transnasal, nasal. I would try to do that posteriorly. That's a separate talk all to itself. And extradural, pathology is really by direct decompression, either endonasial, transoral, transmandibular, or endoscopic transcervical. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it open for questions if people have some. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, JP. That was, uh, that was really fascinating. Maybe, you, maybe we'll take some questions, uh, but perhaps you can put some of those illustrations because I, I feel like we're gonna have a few questions about, uh, about technique and uh, Dr. Galdino, Jennifer asks, uh, how do you position the patient for the indirect decompression? For the indirect decompression. So I don't have any uh, uh, interop pictures for that, but essentially um, it really depends what you're, what you're planning to do for um, that indirect decompression, meaning that I'm a person now who likes to get intraoperative imaging after I've placed my screws to verify that the screws are in good position. So luckily where I am, we have the luxury of having either an aero CT scanner or an O-arm. And so I can get that easily because I like to leave the room knowing that my screws are where I thought they were. Okay. So because of that, that means that I've positioned my patients now on a, on a um, Jackson table prone. Whereas when I was in Baltimore, we didn't have these things. So, um, I mean, not to for a long time. And so I positioned my patients really on, a, on chest rolls on an AMSCO table with a Mayfield. 
Um, but if you need intraoperative imaging uh, that requires you to have a radiolucent table, you're going to have to do it on the Jackson type table. Um, the other important thing to keep in mind is separate in your mind what is, uh, what's, where's the instability coming from? So patients that have odontoid fractures or osodontoidium that you're fusing, right? Because of C1, C2 instability, they're different than these people. Those people are wildly unstable patients. And so when you position them, you need to position them in a very neutral way so that you're very careful when you're translating them from supine to, to prone. If you have somebody who has C1, C2 instability from a ligamentous issue, if you're posteriorly translating their head, you're essentially bringing the odontoid up against the anterior arch of C1. And so that's a safer way to hold their head, if that makes sense. If you do that with an odontoid fracture or osodontoidium, you, you, you might pit them. Another question by Dr. Goodwin. If one does not use an endoscope in practice, what is the learning curve like, or do you have particular suggestions on your use of it, et cetera? Taking a course or something like that. Well, I would definitely uh, take a course, practice on it, maybe in a cadaver lab or so. But I think that um, it really also depends on what your kind of three-dimensional visualization and understanding of the anatomy is of how quickly I think that learning curve is. But the endoscopes now are so good that I think the curve isn't that bad uh, for this. But it, you know, it, it does require getting comfortable with it. Um, you know, I, I have zero familiarity of using endoscopes for MIS lumbar operations, whether or not you're doing these transpyramidal type of MIS type of operations or even down a tube. I imagine them being very difficult in my hands doing that, but that's probably because I've never really tried getting used to those scopes. Um, these, these are two dimensional scopes. So you don't, you lose that perspective of 3D vision, right? And you can get very easily lost there. And that's why the navigation is helpful. The other thing that I always tell our, our residents is that, you know, don't get too caught up with the navigation because the these things are unstable entities. So there's a lot of motion there. And so you can be completely off with your navigation, even if you get intraoperative registration with imaging. So things change and you gotta be, you just have to understand what you're looking at. Beautiful. Um, another question, uh, uh, JP, um, in terms of surgical approach going ventrally, you know, uh, reducible lesions and what have you, um, uh, you know, if you can't emphasize the uh, thought process in terms of when to go transnasal, when to go high cervical retropharyngeal or transfer cervical retropharyngeal, is there like, is the position of the heart palate relative to the uh, uh, C1, C2 complex or the uh, uh, assimilated, uh, sorry, the uh, 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 cranial settling odontoid uh, position uh, factor into the, the decision making? It does. So I think there's a couple things that factor into it. And, you know, um, some of it is, is what people are most familiar with, right? And so a lot of people are now familiar with endoscopic and nasal approaches just from them being so popularized with the, um, the skull-based techniques. So many people feel more comfortable going after that. Whereas they look at this approach of going through the neck as something that's kind of foreign to them, even though the actual approach is very accustomed to what they do, right? Um, so I think that factors a lot into how you go, but you really need to see, um, maybe my last slide will probably summarize this a little bit, but you really need to see where your pathology is that you're going for, right? So if, um, you know, this is a normal cervical spine, a normal skull base, but you need to see, can I actually get to where I'm going by drawing a line, right? Because if you go in endoscopic and a nasal to something, you got to remember that either you're, your endoscope, it's going to hit the, you know, the top of the nose and it won't be able to crank low enough sometimes to get down here. The hard palate can sometimes be in the way to get even lower as well. So you have to decide whether or not you're going to be removing that and whether or not you can make that angle if you're going in a nasal. The same is true with you're going transorally. First of all, you have to be able to open the mouth enough to get in there. And then when you're doing that, think about how your working corridor is, how much you can wand up and down and look around these corridors to get to where you want to go. And that's why there's limitations with the transoral approach where that jaw splitting or transmandibular approach became, I wouldn't say popular, but it's very 
useful because once you split the jaw, it actually allows you to bring your view from up here all the way down here so you can look all the way up here, right? That's something that, that's what it allows you to do. The end, the trans cervical approach, what it allows you to do is just get the entire cervical spine in your view. You're gonna have a lot of trouble taking out um, clivus and anything like that up here. So if, you, if that's part of the goal, this is probably not the right operation for it, or maybe part of it might be the right operation. The other thing is you have to have enough uh, neck to work with to get down there. Uh, so I did an operation the other day, which was so painful because uh, it was a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta, but she had about two and a half centimeters between her mandible and her clavicle for me to work in. And, and just, the, just getting down to the cervical spine was, it was torture. And I kept cursing myself, wondering why I was doing it this way, but I knew that going through the nose was impossible on her as well. So, you know, you, you got to pick which, which is the, the devil you're going to go after, I guess. Do you consent your patients, uh, for instance, let's say if they sign up for a uh, very difficult uh, transfer cervical approach saying, okay, we're going to try it. And then if, if we don't get the job done or the, the uh, pathology totally resected, we're going to try a different approach. Uh, so I, I talked to them about all the different approaches, but I, I tell them that if, you know, if we're unable to get it through the trans cervical approach that we, you know, if, especially if the, their whole reason for coming was for that, then we would back out and, and talk about doing the other approaches because it's a totally different setup where, you know, a trans cervical approach in my experience, it's like an ACDF as far as the recovery is concerned, assuming that you don't have complications related to it. Whereas a trans oral approach or particularly a trans mandibular approach, that's a longer intubation, longer hospital stay. And the same is true, true for an nasal approach is that you know, there's different flaps that you're going to have to mobilize and, and things like that, that, that aren't necessary with that trans cervical approach. JP, this is uh, Matthew Gubin at, at Wash U. I uh, uh, did my fellowship at, in Baltimore after you'd left and uh, I had to hear probably, you know, once every couple of weeks how, how it was too bad that I was there after you were gone because you were, you were truly the master uh, or are the master. So uh, I just want to say thanks for giving this talk. This was really outstanding, uh, uh, really good. Thanks for flattering me, Matt. <laughs> <laughs>
anterior cervical discectomies and just took them out. Well, it's not too terribly destabilizing, but it does destabilize them to a certain degree. So they do get a little bit of a kyphosis, but people got away with that. I don't recommend it, but people did it, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah, All but right. you're doing so, an OC fusion in the back, so you got to definitely... Yeah, and usually... It's a big lever arm. you got to going to go down to C3, 4 posteriorly. At least C4. And, and frequently I'd have to say C5 because the bones are just in these patients are not the greatest to get fixation. So, Great. Wonderful. Um, well, if we have no last comments, we're going to uh, uh, finish here just a minute or two early. Thank you, uh, JP, for this uh, terrific talk. Uh, as everybody knows, they, this will be uploaded to, uh, to our YouTube channel in the next uh, day or so. And uh, next week, next Thursday, we will be here, same time, and uh, we will have uh, with us uh, Dr. Park, Paul Park, who's uh, one of our phenomenal uh, colleagues, spinal neurosurgeons from uh, University of uh, Michigan. So uh, that flyer will go out in the next few days. Uh, thanks, everyone, on behalf of my uh, faculty co-hosts, colleagues, and uh, thank you, JP, for joining us, and uh, everybody have a great night. Thank you very much, Ali, for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, JP. Have a good night, guys. Bye-bye.